It was kind of interesting. It was, uh, you know, when I say Cox City, I'm referring to, uh, it used to be Isosporus suis, and now is Cisto Isosporus suis, uh, is the more common accepted name now. And because there's a couple different coccidias in pigs, and but the the Cisto Isosporus suis is is the main primary pathogen that uh, that affects pigs. And it's kind of interesting. It was first identified back in the 50s. Uh, and really not assigned any significance till about 1978, actually. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me is Dr. Stephanie Rossow, a veterinary diagnostician at the University of Minnesota and somebody that's been a thought leader in diagnostic uh, assays and submissions really for the swine industry for, for the entirety of my career. Uh, Dr. Rossow, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, look forward to hearing what you've got uh, to say today. But before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Give them a little background on yourself. Okay, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, to talk today. Um, I've been, um, uh, as I tell people of recent, that you know, I opened my first dead pig in 1978, uh, and so I've been spent most of my career here at the University of Minnesota in the veterinary veterinary diagnostic lab, really focused on pig diseases, um, uh, whether they're infectious or uh, or uh, production related and um, and so that's essentially all close to 30 years now I've been uh, been working on pigs so um, I hope I can bring a little experience to uh, uh, to my uh, opinions and um, and observations salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans as the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Excellent. Well, I think that's a perfect introduction, um, Dr. Rossow, for our, our topic today. We're going to talk about um, a new PCR assay that you and your team at uh, Minnesota developed not that long ago, a PCR for coccidia. And um, it's certainly a pathogen that's been around since that first pig you would have posted in the late 1970s. Um, but a, a new assay, a new way to, to help producers and veterinarians in the field understand the coccidia burden on their farm. You want to talk a little bit about, um, for an old disease, why you built a new technology to help with the diagnostic efforts there? Sure. Uh, and coccidia is kind of interesting. It was, uh, you know, when I say coccidia, I'm referring to, uh, it used to be Isosporus suis, and now is Cisto Isosporus suis, uh, is the more common accepted name now and because there's a couple different coccidias in pigs and but the the cisto isosporus is is the main primary pathogen that uh, that affects pigs and it's kind of interesting it was first identified back in the 50s uh and really not assigned any significance till about 1978 actually um and so uh just kind of goes to show between when we find something and figure out how important it is can some time can pass. But we've noticed, um, you know, coccidia, uh, as I'll refer to in, in pigs, primarily a farrowing house disease. We can see kind of a, some more recent burgeoning and immediate post weaning uh, pigs also, but uh, really an important disease of that young pig uh, and trying to prevent infection in a pig because, you know, piglets that are just a few days old that get coccidia have a far worse outcome than, than pigs that may pick it up um, later, later in life. And historically, um, we've relied on histopathology uh, to do a lot of that early coccidia diagnosis. And histopathology works very well uh, for diagnosing coccidia. Um, it's just that, you know, over the years, it's, they've noticed that, you know, we're 
probably seen fewer piglets euthanized uh, and sent in specifically for diagnostics. People are making more of a use for anti-mortem uh, or, or live piglet samples, um, as well as post-mortem samples. And um, so one of the couple of things that we run across uh, with post-mortem post samples is that the structure of the intestine, there's villi that stick out and project into the lumen. And when pigs die, though, they start to decompose fairly quickly within 15 to 20 minutes of, of death. And that's those tips of the villi are really where we see the coccidia on histopath. And so um, that kind of lessens the impact or value of, of histopath in those cases. And then it's really a segmental disease in the small intestine. And by segmental, I mean that, you know, it's not the same from the, where it, where it, uh, where the small intestine exits the stomach to where it enters the colon. It can occur to different degrees in different areas. And, and we look more commonly kind of at the middle to bottom of the small intestine. And so uh, even if you have great samples and you just send in one section, you know, the odds are that probably not going to find it uh, in just one section of small intestine. Um, and so it seemed like there's probably a better way uh, to find coccidia, especially in these younger pigs. Uh, you can do fecal floats for coccidia oocysts, but they're not always, they're not going to be present in the really acute cases. And then even as pigs age and get older to where they're shedding, it's not always a consistent um, uh, shedding oocysts in the feces. And so uh, we wanted to, thought there was a way to better apply, um, do some better diagnostics for coccidia. And so uh, we looked at a PCR test um, that we can use concurrently with anti-mortem samples. And so swabs or fecal samples, even post-mortem intestinal samples uh, coming in that um, we can use to test for you know, the rotaviruses, do cultures on, look for a PED, Delta Corona, and then add coccidia uh, into the mix on that. And uh, uh, initial results have been very promising. Uh, it looks uh, like we're, uh, when we validated it and correlate it to um, the histopath from known cases with you know nice histopath lesions, good submissions, uh, there's a real good correlate to, to histopathology lesions. And so, um, we're still kind of early days in, in the big picture on it, but so far I think it's been valuable and, and really will be uh, a good uh, addition to the toolkit for looking at those farrowing house uh, diarrhea samples um, that come in. And one thing that's been a little interesting uh, that um, probably have underappreciated it maybe is these end of farrowing, early post weaning, villus atrophy cases where we didn't necessarily find lots of coccidia on histopath. Again, whether there's autolysis or um, a lack of sections, but we get some pretty strong PCR results back for, uh, for, uh, for the uh, coccidia. And um, so you know, coccidia is listed as kind of being kind of a biphasic event that pigs go through. So I don't, you know, could be a representation of that. Kind of the question that we get commonly is, okay, you know, what does what's the CT value that's important on it? Um, and if you're not familiar with CT values, it's just a representation on the PCR test of strength of signal, which the lower the number, the stronger the the stronger the result. It's a little uh, opposite of what you might think. But when then looking at tissues with you know multiple sections where we get nice villus atrophy, you can see lots of coccidia. Uh, in them, we'll get CT values in the 18 to 23 range, so not untypical for what we see for other enteric diseases in pigs. Um, and um, you know, I, it, you know, interpreting that, it's 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 not necessarily just a straightforward thing. Um, you know, we've got to consider the sample that you sent in and the age of the pig you sampled. You know, we'll get for lack of uh, a better sample that they can get. Sometimes we just kind of get a brown discolored swab in. 
-hmm. And so when we're you know doing cultures and a bunch of different rota PCRs and PED and and so sometimes the sample volume might not be there. So you know if we got a 32 CT and a five day old pig, I'd probably be more inclined to interpret that as significant because I would really don't want a five day old pig to be positive for coccidia as opposed to say like a 23 day old pig that has a 32 CT value, which is just probably, you know, just kind of a subclinical background infection, which could be informative, but uh, really different on, on interpretation. Do, do you need to adjust um, your kind of thresholds for CT interpretation based on the sample type? Would we expect stronger signals generally from tissue cases than from feces, or, or am I thinking that thinking too deep on that? And same CT kind of thresholds can be applied to any sample type for this PCR. So far, it's it's I think it's you know it's in uh, from looking at the coccidia, it's very similar, uh, and 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 that holds true for things like rotavirus and other enteric diseases. Is that you know if you do a side by side with what we see on histopath and then just clinical samples from pigs, they have a similar range, uh, very similar range on uh, on them. The um, uh, consideration on, on uh, like most any diagnostic test, you know, even with PCRs and really sensitive tests, to me still, you know, like 90, 95% of finding the right answer is getting the right pig at the right time. Uh, and that's, you know, the whole, like I said, that's still the biggest thing on, on diagnostics for most anything is still, you know, and, and it's a skill set that some people excel at, and it's a skill set that other people don't necessarily excel at. So, uh, you know, if you've got someone on the farm that's really good at, you know, picking up, uh, you know, what, who the right pig is, uh, the right time to sample, that's, that's by and far still the most important um, part of of getting the right answer for for the tests. And so, kind of hoping that maybe you know you see those furring crates that have the gray yellow fecal material smeared along the edge of the crate. Uh, it's kind of you know oh you know maybe we've got some coccidia. So hopefully it's maybe just some fecal material from the crate as a pooled sample and and uh, and get an answer back and and then go from there. Sounds like a, an excellent um, addition to the toolbox. It's a diagnostic test for a pathogen that we, we worry about quite a bit. Um, to your point, especially in very young pigs, it can be um, fairly significant in terms of the performance impact if you don't have it under control. And uh, it sounds like we've got uh, good flexibility on the sample type to submit. Everything from tissues to the feces, kind of your more environmental samples. Um, I really appreciate uh, not only the development of, of that assay, but also you coming on and chatting with us about it, Dr. Rossa. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, glad to uh, glad to provide some options for people because uh, you know, it's, you know, one thing doesn't always uh, fit for everybody. So, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. And to our audience, thank you for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please check us out at swinehealthblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on the next episode. For Dr. Stephanie Rossow, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for being a part of the podcast with us this week. Appreciate you joining and please have a great rest of your day.